Good morning, everyone. Please join me today in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Kasirsky to today's Talk Tuesday. The title is Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening and Prevention. So why is this topic so important? Um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and it provides an opportunity for us to raise awareness about the importance of early screening and detection of breast cancer. It's also a time where we can bring our community together and remember those who have struggled with this disease. We're also gonna to talk today about cervical cancer, the only cancer to date that can be prevented by administering an effective and safe vaccine, um, which is the HPV vaccine. Um, Dr. Jennifer Kasirsky is here today with us. She's a well-renowned um, obstetrician and gynecologist who works at MediClinic Parkview Hospital. Um, she is an American board certified um, OBGYN doctor with over 25 years of experience. She's a fellow of the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology and has worked in many large hospitals across the US and in Dubai. So without further ado, please welcome um, Dr. Jennifer Kasirsky. Hi, um, thank you, Dr. Omaima. That was a very kind introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna start by um, talking a little bit about breast cancer. Um, and then we'll um, talk about, um, more so we'll talk about the HPV vaccine uh, as it affects um, our kids, right? Um, and I apologize, I, I really don't love web webinars because I can't see everybody's faces. I don't even know how many people are watching. Um, I hope there are some people watching. If not, I guess we're just recording this for posterity. posterity. Um, anyway, breast cancer. Um, I thought I'd just go over some really basics um, and hopefully those of you who need mammograms, this will be your push to get a mammogram this year. Um, so basically, I just want everyone to know what the prevalence is, the cause, the risk factors for breast cancer, ways that we can prevent breast cancer and ways to detect it early. And that's really the goal, early detection. Um, how common is it? Um, it's the most common cancer of women in the US, right? Um, the statistics I have are a little bit old, but um, over 200,000 women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer in the US in 2018. And it's the second leading cause of death in the US after lung cancer, okay? The good news is that rates have been steadily declining since 1989. But um, I believe the statistic is by the time you reach your 80s, uh, one in three women will have had breast cancer. That's a lot, right? Um, I, may he rest in peace, Donald Rums, Rumsfeld, um, if, if those of you are, are not young enough to, or not old enough to remember him, um, he um, was a, a statesman and um, he had this uh, quote, um, most of the causes of breast cancer, we don't know. Um, there are some very um, clear kind of um, reasons to get breast cancer. Um, and unfortunately, being female is one of them. And that's just something, right, you're just not going to change. Um, we think that um, about 5 to 10% of breast cancer is hereditary. Um, BRCA1 and 2 are the most common genes. And then there are probably other factors that cause gene mutation. I think... Um, much ado has been made about um, genetic links to breast cancer, but um, if you think about only five to 10%, that's not actually that much. Um, other risk factors. So like I said, being a woman, um, aging, the older you get, the higher your risk. Um, uh, most breast cancers, I'm sorry, this isn't uh, filled out, but most breast cancers are, for, are in women who are over the age of 50. Okay, um, having a, a personal history or a family history. And that's one of the most significant things. Um, if you have a first degree relative, so a mother or a sister or a father or a brother, because men do get breast cancer, um, that's a significant risk factor. And especially if they develop breast cancer before the age of 45. Um, you know, we, when I take a, a history of patients and they say, my second cousin twice removed, you know, had breast cancer, am I at risk? Not so much. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Um, having a male relative with breast cancer is pretty um, significant. Um, being of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, 
um, if you have an early menstruation and a late menopause. So lots and lots of years of estrogen production, okay, can cause um, breast cancer or be a risk factor, I should say, for breast cancer. Um, a first pregnancy after age of 30 or not being pregnant at all. Um, pregnancy is um, protective, even though pregnancy has super high levels of estrogen, pregnancy is protective against breast cancer as is breastfeeding. And then being overweight um, or obese, especially after you go through the menopause uh, is a risk factor. Um, decreased physical activity and having um, one to two uh, or more alcoholic drinks a day and then ionizing radiation, like if you were treated for lymphoma. The alcoholic drinks I think is really interesting. And there was a really great article in the New York Times, um, I think last week about how actually in the US, a lot of um, alcohol companies, right? Like beer makers and whatever, they put out pink beer and they really trying to promote um, breast cancer awareness month in October. But the fact of the matter is, we should have been avoiding all of their products. So it's become a little controversial. Um, and it's something that we really, you can modify in your behavior, decreasing your alcohol consumption. And it's something that I think um, doctors don't talk about all that much, um, but I think that we should start talking about it a little bit more. Um, a little humor. Um, so what can you do to prevent breast cancer? right? Being as lean as possible without being underweight. And I would say that one of my tips for those of you who are perimenopausal or going into the menopause, um, you want to be the weight that you want to be and um, as fit as you want to be before you go into menopause. Because not that it's all downhill after menopause, but it's a lot harder to lose weight after menopause. And um, you know, that's also the time of your life when maybe your kids um, need a lot of attention, um, that perimenopause, menopausal time. And so it's really hard to take care of yourself when you know, you've got kid responsibilities. So moderate to intense exercise can also be helpful to decrease your risk of breast cancer. As I said, cutting back on uh, alcohol and um, having kids early and breastfeeding might be a little bit too late for everybody in this group. Um, but, um, maybe we encourage other women to think about uh, childbirth early. So how do we screen for breast cancer? What um, are the things we can do? Um, the, the biggest, um, way we can, um, help with breast cancer is to find it earlier and treat it earlier. Um, mammography, so mammograms detect um, signs of breast cancer three years before you find a palpable mass, a palpable lump in your breast. I think that's pretty remarkable. And um, when I have patients who are, you know, a little bit um, concerned about radiation and do I really need a mammogram, um, I usually tell them this and everyone's kind of like, wow, because we tend to put a lot of emphasis on breast self-exams, right? Um, finding the lump yourself. But what if we could find that lump before it becomes a lump? That's, that's pretty significant. Um, clinical breast exams, so going to your doctor, having her do your yearly exam when you have your yearly well woman checkup or doing your own breast exam, um, the studies don't show that we're detecting cancer any earlier with that. Um, so a lot of women say, well, can I just have an MRI? You know, I don't want to have um, a mammogram. I, I want an MRI. And really we reserve MRIs for women who are at really high risk of having breast cancer. Um, and we usually do it in, in addition or in conjunction with a mammogram. Um, one, MRIs are costly, and two, um, they provide more false positives, meaning they say, oh, you might have breast cancer when you really don't. Um, and to that, um, to that end, at my hospital, I, as a gynecologist, can't order an MRI, a breast MRI. It, 
the only person in our hospital in the MediClinic system who can order a breast MRI is actually the breast surgeon because you have to get to that point. You have to get to the point where potentially you need a biopsy um, before anyone um, is going to do an MRI on you. And I think that's just good, um, cautious medicine. So who should get mammograms? right? Um, part of it depends on where you live in the world and what your healthcare system can handle. Um, in the U.S., um, the standard is really starting at age 40 and doing it every year until the age of 80. Um, but if you look at different organizations within the U.S., the American Cancer Society or the U.S. Um, Preventative Task Force Service, they have a little bit um, different um, kind of when to start and how often. Um, the American Cancer Society says at age 45 and have them at yearly at eight, until 54, then every two years. Um, preventative uh, Task Force Service says at age 50 and have them every two years. Um, if you're from the UK, in the UK, they don't usually start mammograms until age 50. And part of that is based on um, population or um, having a public health system that can only um, afford a certain amount of health care per, per person. Um, in the U.S. and here in Dubai, where we have uh, private health insurance, right, so um, we're not looking at um, how we spend our health care dollars uh, as much as some place like the U.K. and the National Health Service. So we tend to start earlier and screen a little bit more often. Um, and the fact of the matter is that women in their 40s will get breast cancer. Um, so I usually recommend um, following what they do in, in your home country. And it, for me, that means recommending mammograms starting at age 40 and then having them yearly. Um, and this just shows you, I mean, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different kind of organizations with basically seven different recommendations. So it's not that there's one hard set in stone um, recommendation. Uh, if you do have a family history of breast cancer, instead of that age 40, we actually recommend starting um, 10 years before the onset of breast cancer in your first degree family member. So for example, if your mom was 45 when she got breast cancer, you would start mammograms at age 35. Now, if she was 55, you wouldn't start at 45, you'd still start at, at 40. So that's just a little bit about breast cancer and I'm happy to entertain any questions if there are any. If anyone has any questions, you can either put them in the chat box or the Q&A or um, just unmute and ask since there are not a lot of people at the moment signed in. I know a lot of people, Dr. Kosterski will watch this, um, the recording, uh, because a lot of the high school students are in class right now, but they are actually going to show it during their advisories. And a lot of people are going to end up watching this later. Um, and then I'm sure some questions will pour in. But if anyone has anything right now, um, please unmute and ask. I'll give you guys a, a minute or so, and then we can move on to the next um, segment of your talk. All right, Dr. Kosierski, I know you have a patient who needs you soon, so why don't you go ahead and um, go into the cervical cancer talk now. And uh, anyone who has questions, please populate the Q&A, and we'll make sure we get um, answers to you guys. Either Dr. Kosierski can do it live, or we can um, send, them, send them to you guys um, in a, in a Q&A document later. Sure. Can you see my presentation? Great. So um, changing topics a little bit. Um, whereas breast cancer uh, does have this big hereditary link, actually cervical cancer we know is basically caused by an infectious disease, um, which we can prevent by vaccinating, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Um, so we're going to talk about the HPV vaccine. Um, so in, we do know that certain infections, um, can cause cancer, right? We know that, um, the bacteria H. pylori causes stomach cancer. Um, we know that hepatitis, especially hepatitis B and C can cause liver cancer. Um, we um, know that Epstein-Barr can uh, cause um, cancer, lymphoma. 
Um, and we know that HPV uh, or human papillomavirus, um, certain types um, can cause cancer of the cervix, um, the vagina, um, the anus, and the larynx. Okay. Um, and these are kind of numbers uh, worldwide. They're a little old from uh, 2014. Um, we also know, um, well, as I had just said, that HPV causes non-cervical cancers, okay? So it does affect both men and women. Um, and there has been um, a rise um, of oral pharyngeal cancers, um, especially in men, okay? Um, cervical cancer is the most common type of cancer caused by HPV, um, but, or, or oral, sorry, I don't know why I can't say this, oral pharyngeal cancer um, is now becoming the second most uh, common cancer caused by HPV. And as you can see from this screen, anal cancer, vulvar, vag vaginal cancer, and I had forgot to say before, penile cancer. Penile cancer is kind of the most rarest of all of the cancers caused by HPV, but it still is caused by HPV. Um, so I like to say that um, HPV is as common as the common cold. Um, we know that if you are sexually active with someone else who is sexually act, who has been sexually active with other people, that your um, your risk of it getting HPV is pretty high, and that seventy five to eighty percent of sexually active men and women will be infected with HPV in their lifetime. Um, that that's pretty um, amazing. Um, and you know, of the what 300 million people that live in the US, we think at any one time about 80 million people have the HPV virus with about 12 million new infections each year. That's a lot. Um, HPV is transmitted um, through skin to skin contact, okay? Um, and um, while we know that condoms will prevent a lot of sexually transmitted infections like chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, HIV, um, co condoms are helpful, but don't entirely permit, uh, sorry, prohibit um, transfer of the HPV virus. Because anytime you have kind of skin to skin contact, you can have viral transmission because the virus lives on the external genitalia as well as the internal genitalia. Um, so, you know, when you have a virus that's that prevalent, um, that that is that easy to contract, how do we prevent it? Well, we prevent it by um, making people immune to it, right? I think. Everybody in the world now is a part-time virologist, a part-time you know, doctor of vir viruses because of coronavirus, right? I think there's much more understanding now of how easily viruses can be transmitted and what the goals of vaccinations are, right? There, and, and this idea of herd immunity, right? Getting a big enough population vaccinated so that we prevent further transmission. And that's really been the goal of uh, vaccination with for HPV virus is if we can get a big enough population vaccinated, then we can start to prevent, you know, downstream transmission of the virus. And, and um, actually, the country that's done really the best at this has been Australia. Um, Australia has had a very aggressive um, and thorough uh, vaccination campaign um, of starting out of girls and women to prevent HPV. Um, and the downstream effects have been really interesting in that it's prevented men from getting HPV. Now, unfortunately, we don't have good ways to test men for HPV the same way that we would test a woman. Like we can do basically a pap smear in a woman and through that sample, we can see if she has HPV virus. Um, but we can't swab a penis and see if there's HPV virus on it penis, because the HPV is just much harder to detect, to detect on the external genitalia. So anyway, 
um, talking more about the HPV vac vaccine. Um, the good news is, is that um, we have options for vaccines and actually we have a we have the newest option here in Dubai. Um, in 2014, um, Gardasil 9 was actually available in the US. Gardasil 9, um, which as you can see on this screen, covers the most types of HPV. And, and just to backtrack, there are over a hundred different types of HPV virus, um, but very specific ones can cause uh, cancer, okay? Um, 16 and 18 are the most common type that we see in cancer of all parts. And then 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 are kind of the, the second tier of most common types of HPV that cause cancer. Um, so until um, last year, we didn't have Gardasil 9 in Dubai, um, or we might have had it, but it was really only being made to the local population. But now it's it's available. I think every major um, hospital center has it. I know MediClinic has it, Kings has it. Um, I, so it's it's really um, quite easily available and in good supply. Because the other problem that we were having in years past was that maybe you could get the first or the second dose, but then they'd run out for a while and you couldn't get the third dose, okay? Um, Cervarex um, is a vaccine that I haven't seen in Dubai lately. It was widely available in Europe. And so a lot of folks who come from Europe might've um, had that vaccine. The regular Gardasil was only protective against four types of HPV, the two most common types that cause cervical cancer and the two most common types that cause genital warts. Because the other thing that HPV can do is it can cause genital warts. And while genital warts are ugly and upsetting and maybe painful, they won't kill you. Um, but Gardasil 9, which is kind of the gold standard now for HPV vaccines, protects against all those types of HPV that can cause cancer as well as six and 11, which cause warts. Um, so just to go back, HPV 16 and 18 cause about 70% of all cervical cancers and other cancers. Um, and then six, type six and 11 cause about 90% of genital warts. And so when you get the Gardasil 9 that has um, the four HPV types plus the additional five, um, you're really um, raising the level of protection to 90 to almost 100%. So how, do you, how often, what do you get? Um, basically, it's either a two-dose schedule or a three-dose schedule, depending on your age, right? So if you're under the age of 14, by the time you could finish your um, vaccine schedule, then you only need two doses, right? So um, given the first dose and then six to 12 months later, you would get the second dose. If you're not gonna finish your vaccines until after the age of 14, uh, 15 or older, then you do need three doses at um, basically zero, two months. And then the third dose has to be at least six months after the first dose, okay? Um, so pretty easy dosing schedule. And, you know, a lot of the HPV vaccine, um, really the time that you would get a meningitis vaccine, and Dr. Omaima can, can chime in here since she's a pediatrician, um, but around the time that you would get your meningitis vaccine is the same time that you can um, start your HPV series. Um, so it's something I would um, suggest that you bring up with your pediatrician. Um, Everyone is always concerned about um, vaccine safety, right? Um, is this safe? Um, that's been um, a big question with the COVID vaccine, right? The COVID vaccine is super new. It's been around for less than a year. The HPV vaccine has been around for a long time, almost 20 years now. Um, and we're not seeing, you know, girls who were vaccinated when they were young have significant health issues or reproductive issues or, or major issues as they've gotten older. Um, I, I love this slide um, because the risk of having a 
really bad reaction to a vaccine is about, and, and this vaccine is about one in a million, right? But you're more likely to be struck by lightning or in a plane crash and have a bad vaccine reaction. Um, yeah, over a hundred million doses of HPV vaccine has been given um, over the, the past 20 years. Um, and, and to put that in context, in context too, because I'll put a plug in for the uh, COVID vaccine, which I, I think we're all pretty accepting of here in Dubai. Do you know there's been 1 billion doses of the Pfizer vaccine given, or COVID vaccine given worldwide? That's a lot of vaccine. Um, so um, side effects, mostly they're just local side effects that you'd see with a lot of vaccines, pain, redness, soreness, maybe having a little bit of a fever, maybe being tired or feeling fatigued. That's pretty par for the course for any kind of vaccine. And you see it with the HPV vaccine. Um, and, you know, to go back to what I said in the beginning, because I think it sounds a little scary to hear that 80 million uh, Americans have the HPV um, virus, um, but that doesn't mean that 80 million Americans are gonna get cancer, right? Um, the, the HPV is, is the iceberg under the, the water and actually getting cancer is, is the part of the iceberg that you see, right? So very few HPV um, infections will actually lead to cancer. And part of that is because we screen for it. We get pap smears, that's the screening test for cervical cancer. Um, and part of it is because immune um, systems will fight the HPV virus and, and also because we're vaccinating, because we're helping um, improve immunity against the HPV virus. Um, so I think that's all I have, and I'm happy, but I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Kasirski. We have a couple. Um, I didn't realize uh, that actually um, people can't unmute, and so I'm going to read the questions. So if you have any questions, guys, please put them in the um, uh, question box. So um, this question is, besides breast lumps, what other signs are there to um, detect um, breast cancer um, or any signs that we should look for when examining our own breasts that should concern us? Sure. So, I mean, I can very quickly tell you in terms of a breast exam, um, you want to look at your breasts undressed, obviously, in the mirror, and you want to look to see the way they fall. You want to make sure nobody's symmetric, right? We're not, um, one side doesn't have to look exactly like the other, but you want to make sure that there's no really, really big differences. And you want to look at your skin. You want to make sure that there's no redness, no um, kind of orange peel uh, appearance of your skin. We call that a uh, peau d'orange, um, which is can be a sign of a certain type of, of breast cancer. Um, and then, yeah, you just want to, you know, one hand behind your head, the other hand, you can see, um, you want to, in a very systematic way, examine your breast. And you also want to feel up under your arm because you're feeling for anything that feels like a swollen gland. So swollen glands in the neck or under the arm can also be another sign of something not good happening in your body. Thanks, um, Dr. Kasirskin. Is there anything you wanted to mention about menopause? Is there anything different to look out for um, during or a while, you know, after menopause that would be any different than those signs? No, those are, I mean, they're the signs. But, you know, the idea of a mammogram is to get, to find breast cancer before you actually get that lump, right? So I would encourage women um, over the age of 40 to get mammograms. Absolutely. And the next question has to do with your um, Gardasil vaccine talk. And so some people have received um, a different version of Gardasil, not the Gardasil 9. Um, what's your recommendation for these teens who may be in their 20s now? Or um, should they go out now and get the Gardasil 9 or get a booster? Yeah, there's not, there are, there are no recommendations for the, from the company or um, the FDA or the CDC. Um, in terms of revaccination. So I'm not recommending revaccination. Um, you know, I have teenage kids who got the Gardasil 4, and um, 
um, I, I think that, you know, that that's fine at this point. Um, and I'm sure that if that changed, we would know about that and we would start recommending yeah. it. But for now, I also yeah. have heard that there's no need to redo the vaccine series again. Um, what about if someone got one dose of Gardasil 4, should they finish the series with Gardasil 4 or should they then get the second dose being Gardasil 9? Well, a lot of places now you can't get Gardasil 4. They're just not making it. So yeah, I would just go ahead with a 9. It's going to, I mean, you've gotten the original four um so you're you're kind of adding on to that makes sense thank you um i'm just checking and scanning to see if anyone else had any more questions um someone said that they're convinced to go get their daughter their her hpv vaccine so that's fantastic yeah um i really Great. And I would say that, you know, it's a, it's a gift that we're giving our kids. And I, I, I hope that because people are more aware of what vaccines can do and how they can change their lives, um, that more people do get, you know, especially the HPV vaccine. We don't think twice about getting the measles, um, mumps or rubella vaccine. We don't think twice about getting tetanus. Um, but somehow or other with HPV, we, we all kind of like, oh, you know, um, and it's a shame because I see women with abnormal pap smears every single day that I'm working, not every day of my life, but every day that I'm working, I have a conversation about an abnormal pap smear. And imagine if I didn't have to have that conversation, it would be great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kosierski. We know that you're in need right now by one of your patients, I believe, who needs your help. So we're gonna um, close the uh, Zoom webinar in a few seconds. I just wanna be sure that you agree with my answer. Um, one of the panel, one of the um, listeners asked, at what age would you stop giving the HPV vaccine? Um, oh, so and I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. It's now, it's now, um, uh, uh, authorized, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing the word today, but you can give it up to the age of 45. So in both men and women and, and boys can get the vaccine and they should. Um, we know that it will prevent cancers that we see in men, right? Um, cancers of, of the, the throat and the larynx, um, penile cancer, anal cancer. So boys should be getting vaccinated as well. And also that's going to help to protect women and, and, and girls, right? By making the whole population um, vaccinated, but age 45. Super. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we really appreciate um, all these great tips. And um, for many of us who have teens, we'll um, be sure to think about all this information to make the best decisions to protect our kids, whether they're girls and boys from um, cervical cancer. And um, thank you for all that breast cancer knowledge. Um, I think we're all going to make sure we get our mammograms if we're 40 and above. So thank you so much and You're have welcome. a wonderful day, Dr. Kosierski. Thank you. Have a great Bye. day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.